We're going to start recording. We're going to switch the input. All right. Okay, let's get started. We are winding down. I hear a lot of talk about scheduling, uh, about figuring out uh, what you need to take next semester. Hopefully those discussions involve scheduling meetings with your assigned academic advisor and all that jazz and that you're doing that. Y'all know the drill. Um, <clears throat> fortunately and hopefully for the vast majority of people in this room, it's sort of on autopilot. You're sort of taking what you're taking. Um, but, uh, but yeah, your advisors are there to help. <clears throat> all right. In terms of homework, I didn't check um, whether 5.4 was graded, but uh, I know that at least we were caught up up until 5.4. So 5.4 to 6.1 is being graded. 6.2 was due today. Hopefully that was pretty straightforward. Uh, I think the homework today is going to be even more straightforward. Um, today what we're going to do is design beams. Okay, and We're going to design continuously braced beams. Now I'm going to tell you, the design of a continuously braced beam is more straightforward than the design of a discreetly braced beam. Just full stop. But um, you're going to find that that it um, uh, that that there are a lot of similarities. So you're still going to handle shears the same way. You're still going to handle deflections the same way. The moment capacity is going to be different. Um, you're going to use a different guide, a different region of the spec, um, because the behavior is different. But um, I think you'll find it's pretty straightforward. There is something I do want to talk about, and those are deflection limits or the lack thereof. And if there's any one bone to pick, I would have with that little uh, blue AISA 15th edition steel construction manual that you uh, purchased for this class, it is that there are none. And uh, you'll understand what I mean here in a little bit. Okay? It would help if I plugged this in uh, in order to run the, the little clicker for the slides. All right. So let's recall a couple things. So first off, the ZX tables. Remember, we can use the ZX tables to look up capacity. So it stands to reason that we should be able to use the ZX tables to look up a design that is very, very useful for design. Even in discreetly braced beams, which we'll talk about later, this table is incredibly useful for design. Okay? Um, you can probably also kind of guess how this is going to work. We're going to go to the table find our required ZX or our required MP, but we're not going to select. So like if we were looking at this upper group, we're not going to pick the W10 by 112. We're going to pick the W24 by 62, right? There's no real reason. Well, there may be one reason. I'll talk about that here in a bit. Uh, well, two reasons. Uh, there, uh, but I guess theoretically, there's no point in selecting the W10 by 112 if I could select the W24 by 62 because the W24 by 62 is lighter. Now, there are two reasons I can think of why you would not select a W24 by 62 in that case, why you wouldn't select one of the bold rows. There's two reasons. One is architectural limitations. So if the architect comes in and says something like, hey, here's the deal. You only have 18 inches of space, right? You can't go using a W24 by 62. The beam's too deep. Well, that's, that's a legitimate reason why you might need to back your design off a little bit or use a section that's maybe a little heavier than you want it to. Um, that's the first reason. The second is also a little bit more practical. Maybe they're out. Maybe you go and you uh, um, uh, go to the, the service center or the mill and say, I need a W24 by 62, and they're on back order, right? And that, that's another real reason why you might need to back that off. But we're going to assume infinite supply and, for the most part, no architectural limitations unless it's spe spelled out in the, in the problem. Uh, but you'll, you'll, you'll kind of see how that goes. All right. I do want to talk about a new aid. A new aid is table 3-3. It is much shorter. Um, uh, it, it's, it only takes uh, uh, over a couple of pages of the, uh, of the manual. But um, this is a new aid. This is table 3-3 that I'm calling the IX tables. So in addition to designing beams in order to meet strength requirements or strength limit stakes, we also need to design them in order to meet service limit stakes. Um, and so what that means in beam selection uh, since more often than not, shear ends up not being a problem, the issue is whether or not we have enough moment capacity or we have a big enough IX. Okay? And so likewise, we see uh, our uh, organization of our shapes by IX. And notice the similar grouping. So for instance, we have a group right here. 
and we find the upper, uh, upper row is bolded, that is the lightest uh, shape within that group according to moment of inertia. So instead of sorting it by ZX, we're sorting it by IX, and it's a similar group. Okay, so you'll, you're going to start to see here in a little bit why table 3-3 might be used for design, because there are two limits that beams need to, uh, or three limits that beams need to achieve. Uh, moment capacity, shear capacity, and deflection requirements. And it's possible that in design land, maybe you have a beam that has more than enough flexural capacity, but it's actually the, def or sorry, more than enough moment capacity, but it's actually the deflections that are govern governing the design. And if that's the case, you're not going to select your section based off uh, ZX, you're going to select it based off IX. And again, don't worry, we'll, we'll uh, walk before we can run on this stuff, so we'll take our time. All right, so let's talk about the process. All right, so step one, you need to compute your factored moment. Now, right off the bat, there's a problem, okay? Up until now, we've said, okay, here's the column, uh, here's the tension member, here's the bolted connection, welded connection. Step one is to compute the factored load. But beams, there's a little bit, little bit of a, a, a quirk here we got to work through, okay? Because with beams, uh, we need to compute the factored moment on the beam, and what load must all beams be able to withstand their own self-weight, right? So the problem is... We don't know what the self-weight of the beam is because we haven't picked it yet, right? All right. In design mode, you do not know what the beam looks like, okay? So what that means is you kind of have to assume a self-weight, okay? So what, what do you assume, okay? Well, I would argue common assumptions are somewhere between 50 pounds per foot and 100 pounds per foot. Those are pretty common. More often than not, I will tell you what to assume uh, in design phase, and I'm doing that from a, from a classroom standpoint so that we all arrive at the same answer at the end of the day. But in the real world, you might not know and you have to pick something. Now, with experience and with time you know, in the sector, you'll start to get better at assuming uh, self-weights. You know, the heavier the loads, the bigger the beam needs to be, uh, et cetera. Uh, but I should mention that there are some engineers in steel building design land that don't bother with assuming a self-weight um, during the design phase. Now, you, I don't recommend that, and I don't recommend that for two reasons. First, the, the purpose of assuming a self-weight during the design phase is so that um, you can arrive at a, a given shape for, for analysis. But the point is, once you pick that shape, you have to account for that self-weight anyways during the analysis phase. So if you're going to account for it, you might as well do it throughout. I think it makes it a little easier to reduce your mistakes. So that's the first reason. The second reason is there's a, a chance that the self-weight won't affect your design so much, but there is also a chance that it will. And you run the risk of having to iterate your design more than you need if you don't at least account for a self-weight during the uh, initial selection process. So I kind of think it's a good idea to do that. So step one is you need to compute a factored moment and step two is you need to compute a required IX based on your deflection limits. Now, be careful with the units. Don't forget the 1728 unit conversion factor to get your, your deflections into inches. When, so my point is, after step two, you should have two values. You should have a uh, applied factored bending moment and a required moment of inertia. Those should be the two values that you get after you know, your, your initial assessment. And so what you're going to do is you're going to go into table 3-2 and you're going to select the most economical section that you can. Now, if you've got 50 KSI steel, you can just select straight off the MP uh, column. But if not, what you can do is divide out the effect of FY, so you can take your moment and divide it by 0.9 FY, uh, and just select the section based off ZX. That's actually fine for, for continuously braced beams. So you can still use table 3-2 for uh, design of, uh, of continuously braced beams, even if you don't have 50 KSI steel. Um, but if, 50 K, if, if your FY is not 50 KSI, you're going to manually have to compute the shear capacity. Uh, again, that's probably not going to be a problem, but we haven't talked about how to do that yet, so we'll talk about that later. Now, what we're going to do uh, is this is going to give us a trial shape, and so we're going to find, I don't know, uh, uh, the, the W, I don't know, 24 by 62 that we just saw on the previous slide. We're going to look at that W24 by 62, and we're going to check its moment of inertia. And if its moment of inertia is big enough, then we're fine. But if not, then we're going to have to say, okay, this design is not governed by strength, by moment capacity. It's governed by deflections. Then we're going to go to table 3-3 and look up a section there. 
Uh, and so you back and forth until you find the lightest shape uh, that, that works for both, uh, um, for both guides, uh, and then you analyze the section. And particularly what we're analyzing is moment capacity, shear capacity, and deflection limits. Now, deflections is probably checking it is probably not all that necessary from a mathematical perspective but i think it's a good idea to do it to make sure that you don't have any errors in your computations in other words there's there's no there's no like okay we're going to make an assumption pick a, a a shape and then verify that assumption it's not like with uh with tension members tension members is a good case where you desperately needed to uh to verify your design because if you remember in tension member design we had to assume like our shear lag factor and we had to assume our net area and so we said let's just assume the effective net area is 75 percent of the gross area and we just straight guessed that uh, and then using that guess we selected a member we had to analyze that member to verify that assumption uh, and the assumptions that we need to verify are essentially the self weight in these two regions deflections it's pretty uh, uh it's pretty one to one all right with me so far okay now, I want to talk a little bit about deflection limits. If you remember, the problem that we did in class last time utilized an L over 400 deflection limit. Was that it? And then what was the homework? Was it L over 600? 180. 180. Okay. So what you find is that your deflection limits typically are L over, you know, some number, right? And the bigger that number is, the more stringent the deflection limit. So for example, for bridges, L over 800 is very common, whereas for buildings, L over 360 is a very common limit. And so the idea is that the bigger that number, the more punitive that limit. In other words, we have a, a higher bar that we need to meet. But the question is, where do those limits come from? Like, why is it L over 800, or why is it L over 360? And I would argue that as a designer, if there's any one gripe I would have with the AISC steel construction manual, it's this. So let's talk about the spec, and let's talk about the way the spec is organized, right? So remember, Chapter D, Chapter D was the chapter related to tension members, right? Chapter E was the chapter related to compression members, right? We've already looked at a few. Chapter J was the chapter on connections. Y'all remember that? Now, if you go to Chapter L, Chapter L is the chapter related to serviceability, okay? All right, and you ought to look at it. You ought to take a look at it. And if you go into Chapter L and specifically go into Section L2, this is what it says. Deflections in structural members and structural systems shall be limited so as not to impair the serviceability of the structure. Thanks. That's, that's pretty clear. That's, uh, there's... That's it. That's really all the manual says about deflections. And if there's any one gripe that I do have with the manual is that I wish they would spell it out. Here are the deflection limits that I need to use for my problems, period. Now, and, and to give you a contrast, in concrete, they are spelled out. If you open up the ACI spec, it will flat tell you whether or not you're dealing with a floor beam, whether or not you're dealing with a roof beam, whether or not you're attached to elements that are likely to experience damage or not likely to experience damage, it's very clear. Here's the deflection limit. Whereas for steel design, it's not there. Okay, it, it's it's not available. There's nothing in the manual. Now there are reasons for that. Okay, I would argue that there are good reasons for that. Um, the main reason for not incorporating the deflection limits is so that it, it and the, the you know, it, it's really a benefit of, of utilizing steel is that it allows the structural engineer and the client to tailor um, their structure to meet their given requirements. And that seems very fancy, but I'm going to give you a real world example to kind of explain. Okay? Let's say that we were designing a hospital out of using a steel frame structure. So, uh, I mean, what, what's in a hospital? Well, there's patient rooms, there's hallways. There's a lot of routine stuff that you see in just about any other building. But isn't there some sensitive equipment in hospitals? Maybe like the MRI, right? Have you ever seen an MRI? It's huge, right? Maybe as the structural engineer, 
I can design the rest of the most of the building utilizing an L over 360 deflection limit, but oh, the room with the MRI, I need to design that with like an L over 1000 or an L over what have you, because that's sensitive when we can't let the floor deflect very much. It's very, very sensitive. Maybe there's some lab precision equipment where it's got to sit still. And so without specking out a codified limit, it allows the detailer a little, a little bit of flexibility to work with the client. Um, to be honest, I think that's a good reason, but I think you could develop language in the spec that would allow some flexibility. But for most routine design, I would kind of like to see a spelled out limit. Now fortunately, AISC realizes this. Um, AISC publishes a series of design guides, and they're numbered. So there's like design guide three, to four, five, six, seven, or what have you. And I think there's like 30 of them right now. Um, design guide three is serviceability design uh, considerations. It, 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 it's a PDF. You can download it. If you all are students, you can download all of these design guides for, for free. You just have a, an AISC student account, which everybody had to create for buying the manual. Uh, and you can download these design guides for free, which, by the way, you ought to do that just for the sheer economics of it. If you had to buy all these things, they're expensive. I mean, they're, they're you know, each one, you know, I think, I don't know what the price is, but I think you'd be talking about thousands of dollars if you had to buy all of them. And they're, I mean, uh, they're really good. And, and what they tend to do is they tend to cover things that you don't normally cover in, a typical undergraduate uh, 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 steel design course, but that you might experience in real life. Um, so for example, serviceability design considerations, torsion, um, composite design, and what have you, stuff that you might deal with in the real world, uh, but it, the idea is that if you have a, a strong enough background in basic steel design, these design guides will, will help you work through it. And so if you look, for example, if we're looking at serviceability considerations, if we look at plastered ceiling versus non-plastered ceiling, floor beams, L over 360, we can see where a lot of these deflection limits uh, are coming from. So it gives you kind of an idea of where these things are coming from. So for instance, uh, for example, plastered ceiling, roof member, L over 360. So we can see where these uh, are coming from. So these are some suggested limits uh, for design. And I would argue that most uh, engineers are probably using stuff like this unless they're dealing with uh, specific scenarios where their client uh, is is specking out some specifics. Whew. Sound good? I think that the, the best way of going through the wonderful world of steel beam design is to do an example. So I want to design this beam. Okay, I have a dead load of 1.2 kips per foot. It's simply supported. Uh, and I have a live load of 40 kips placed at mid-span. Okay, um, we're going to design a continuously braced beam. We're going to use 50 KSI steel. We're going to assume a self weight of 50 pounds per foot. And we're going to ensure that the beam meets a live load deflection limit of L over 600. So admittedly, this deflection limit is a little bit stringent. But I'm doing this because I want to make sure that you're able to follow along what happens from a design uh, standpoint. So let me, uh, let me get out of this, go to here. Yes. Oh, yes. And you're, you'll, it'll be very clear to understand how that works in the next little bit. Like you'll, you'll get what I'm talking about, uh, and we'll, we'll be able to game out how it works, not just for this example, but you'll, you'll, you'll get it when you say, well, what if we assumed a different value? How would it affect things? And you'll kind of see what I'm talking about. Um, and, and again, it's kind of easier to just go through it and do it. So there's, there's a couple things I kind of want to sort out with this problem. All right. I'll give you a sec to, to jot this down, and then we'll, we'll get to it. Everybody good? Okay, all right, so the first thing that we need to do is we need to compute 
are uh, oops, compute mu and vu. Okay, so what that means is we need to analyze this structure for both the dead load and the live load cases specifically. Uh, we need to look at uh, uh, our resulting mu and vu, uh, uh, or m, m dead, v dead, m live, v live uh, results. Okay. So I want to deal with the dead loads first. And we'll say dead loads plus self-weight. All right, so we have a beam. And so if we look at the self-weights or the dead loads, we're talking about this case. Okay, and we were told that the dead load is 1.2 kips per foot, but we also have a self weight. And what were we told for, for this problem to assume as a self weight? 50 pounds per foot. So this is 50 pounds per foot. Or 0.05 kips per foot, okay? And this beam is 35 feet long, okay? So fortunately, the AISC Steel Construction Manual does a lot for us in terms of doing this uh, computation for us. So all we have to do is look up our appropriate case, which in this case is case one. And we know that W, in this case, is going to be 1.25 kips per foot. L is 35 feet. So therefore, V dead is WL over 2. Is everybody okay with that? Which is... 1.25 kips per foot times 35 feet over 2. And then M dead is WL squared over 8. So what do we got for V dead? And then for the um, M dead, we'll say two decimal places, that's enough. And what's our units? There we go. Okay. So that should be pretty easy. So far, so good? Okay. Now, for the... So that's the dead loads. What about the live loads? Hold on. Live loads. So for the live loads, we're given a beam, and we have simply supported, and we're told that we have a concentrated load of 40 kips right in the middle. We know this is 17.5 feet, 17.5 feet, and this is 35 feet. Okay, that's 100% correct. Now, I want everybody to listen to the words coming out of my mouth right now, okay? If you have the instinct, I want everybody to look up here, listen to the words coming out of my mouth, all the way from the laptops and eyes up here. 
That includes you, Mr. Whitehead. There you go. That, that right up here. That, that up here. Come on. Come on. I'm here. I'm, I'm, I'm here. If you have the instinct to do something like this, and you say 1.14 kips per foot, right? Because you're, you know, doing something like this, and you're saying this is 35 feet, right? Because you're saying, all right, this is 40 kips, right? So I can take that 40 kips, spread it out, and use WL over 2 and WL squared over 8, right? If you have that idea in your head, I want you to imagine, visualize that I'm throwing an eraser at you. <laughs> like, picture it. Clearly. Don't do that. Here's why. We're talking about assessing bending moments in shear. I'm asking you what's worse, lumping 40,000 pounds right in the middle or spreading it out. That's worse, right? If you do this because you want to use these formulas, no, that does not work. Are we clear on that? Now, what did you say? Use a different case. That's the correct way of going about it. So this is wrong. Case 7, P is 40 kips, L, 35 feet. So VL is something, ML is something. What's VL? P over 2. So I think I can do that one in my head. That's 20 kips. And what's ML? No, that, okay, that's the function. But what's M max? There you go, PL over 4. And to be clear, right, there's nothing here that you couldn't figure out by just drawing the shear and moment diagram, right? So 40 kips, right? So that's 20 and that's 20. And so your shear diagram does the stair step. The maximum shear is 20 kips. Take the area under the shear diagram, plot your moment diagram. That's what you're going to get. All right, what does this come out to be? 350 foot kips. All right. So if you do this, this is the eraser launch method. That's what this is. This is the eraser launch method. Okay. Visualize it. Yeah, just visualize it. What? <laughs> All right, so now we have our factored loads. Okay, so V dead was 21.875. VL is 20 kips. And so with these, I can say VU is 1.2 V dead plus 1.6 V live. Okay. So that's just going to be 1.2 times 21.875 plus 1.6 times 20. Okay. And so what do we get here? All right. All right. M dead. 191.41 ML 350. So just chug it out. Foot kips. And so what do we get for this? We'll say what, 789.7, something about like that. So VU is 58.25 kips, MU 789.7 foot kips. All right. 
let's sort of like highlight that. But that's sort of like the result of step one. This is our structural analysis, right? Our maximum shear for design, maximum moment for design. That's it. So far so good? Okay. Any questions? Now, here's the thing, though, to keep in the back of your head before we move on. What are these values based on? These are based on an assumed self-weight of what? 50 pounds per foot. You keep that in the back of your head because that might be, be important a little later. All right. Now, step two. Hold on. Step two. I've got something here on my pen. Compute. Your required IX. Okay. Here's how I like to handle this. So the first thing I like to do is let's handle the limit. And the limit was L over what for this problem? 600. All right, so that's 35 feet over 600. But deflection limits... We're talking about inches here. So what does that come out to be? 0 0.7 inches. Okay? So that's our limit. Our deflection cannot exceed that. What is the actual deflection on our beam? And specifically, we're talking about a maximum live load deflection. What is that? for this problem. Well, how do we determine that? What's our live load? Our live load is, we're dealing with this case right here. Right? So what's the maximum deflection from a simply supported beam subjected to a concentrated load at mid-span? PL cubed over 48 EI. I don't know why my pen is trailing like that. It's a little annoying. Y'all see that? I don't know why it's doing that, this little scratchiness. It kind of just started that in the past couple seconds. It's kind of annoying me. All right. Okay. So let's look at this expression. What's P? L is 35. This is 29,000. What we don't know is this, right? Now let's be clear. There's something that I'm going to need to throw in the mix here. And that's 1728. I got to throw that in there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to set these two expressions equal to one another and solve for ix. So let's do that. Let's do a little bit of algebra. So how do I isolate IX? Can't I just flip and multiply? Can't I just take the IX multiplied over here, the 0.7 divided by there? So maybe what I'm dealing with is we'll call this IX min we'll call this um, And so we're dealing with that. So what do we got? We've got 40 kips. We've got uh, 35 feet, but that's cubed. So don't forget the cube. Forty-eight, twenty-nine thousand 29,000 KSI, 0 0.7 
inches. And so what do we get from this? So again, everything from our formula is there. I just put the unit conversion in green. So. Right? So our IX minimum is 3041.4 inches to the fourth. Okay. Remember I told you that at the, at the end of the first two steps, that's what you're going to be left with. You're going to be left with a factored moment and this. Now notice how this value is in no way, shape, or form based on assumptions, right? It's just based on our live load, right? So this is going to be true regardless of what our beam self-weight is. But what is this saying? Let's think about this number. Remember, moments of inertia are a reflection of beam stiffness. So the bigger this value is, the stiffer the beam is and the less it will deflect. That's why I'm saying it's IX minimum. Okay. Um, so as long as we pick a beam that has a moment of inertia, at least this if not bigger, we know we've satisfied our deflection requirements. Okay. But keep in mind we also have to meet this limit too. All right. So here's how we're going to do this. All right. So let's go to step three, select trial section based off MU. Okay, so note for a continuously braced beam, VMN is this. Now, MU was 789.7 foot kips. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to open up table 3-2. We're going to ignore the moment of inertia for now, but we're going to open up table 3-2 we're going to find the first section that has a VMP, that's the first blue column, a VMP of 789.7. Now, I would argue that we could probably go with a W18 by 97, but is that the one we want to pick? You're shaking your head no. What's the one we want to pick? All right, well, hold on. We're, 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 walk, we're, we're running before we walk, all right? And I see what you're saying. I see what you're saying. There, okay, just, just, just. I'm glad that you see it. I'm glad that you see it. I do. So we're going to try a W24 by 84. So we're going to take it one step at a time. So this is the first bold row with a capacity larger than that. So we selected it based on a VMP of 840. But what is the problem with the W24 by 84? IX is 2370. So because of this, the W24 by 84 is inadequate. So what this is saying is that if we went with a W24 by 84, we would have enough strength, but it would be too flimsy. It would deflect too much. That's the problem. So we can't use a W24 by 84. We now need to go to a new table. Now, I'm going to address the section that you picked here in a second. Just bear with me. So now we're going to select a section
based off Ix. Now remember, Ix required was 3041.4 inches to the fourth. So now what we're going to do is go to table 3-3 because table 3-3 organizes our sections based off of Ix. Now, we're going to find something serendipitous here in a second. Just bear with me. But what is the first bold row that has a moment of inertia bigger than this? The W30 by 90. And that just happens to be the next one up that you saw on the ZX table, but it's not always the case. Okay, That's why you have the IX table. right? So now we're going to try a W30 by 90. So a, uh, we're selecting it because its moment of inertia is 36.10. But what's its fee and P? Is it going to have enough capacity? Okay, what is it? 1060. Now, we're going to stop for a sec and make sure that everybody kind of sees what we did. I don't like that one either. Let's do that one. That one's good. Okay. Does everybody see why we picked this section, but it's inadequate? Does everybody then see why we picked this section and then saw that it's probably going to work? Because this is organized by ZX. That's a great question. So table 3.2 is organized by ZX. Table 3.3 is organized by IX. It's not always the case that the bold rows here are, are organized the same way. And I really want you to get into this habit now. Because when we start looking at discreetly braced beams, you're, the design aid, while invaluable, is a lot less pretty. <laughs> and so you are going to really need that IX table for selection based off of serviceability. Trust me. All right. So let me ask you this. Why am I not saying that this is the answer? Ooh. You, all right. Hold on. What was the assumed self weight? So the assumed self weight was 50 pounds per foot, right? What is the problem with this shape? It's heavier, right? So what do you think we have to do? we got to redo our structural analysis. So all those formulas that we used before with 50 pounds per foot, now we need to re-update them. We need to update them with 90 pounds per foot. Does that make sense? Okay. Does everybody follow along with that? Now, I want you to live in an alternate universe, right, multiverse over here, what if this was our assumption? What if we assumed 100 pounds per foot? Could we stop? Yeah, we could stop because we selected this section based on an assumed self weight of 100 pounds per foot. And if the actual self weight is 90 pounds per, per foot, then there's no need to update anything, and we're actually done. Does that make sense? But because the beam is heavier than our assumption, we need to go back and do this analysis. To be clear, I mean, there's a good bit of difference between 1060 and our factored moment of 789. So we're probably good. And we can probably eyeball it and go, it's, you know, yeah, this number is going to increase a little bit, but not all that much. But we're going to be specific about it. Again, we're talking about a beam of 40,000 pounds on it. I don't think that a couple minutes worth of math is that big of a deal. So let me show you how we're going to do this. We're going to do this pretty quickly because I know we're running out of time. So I want you to take my word for it. 
So we have a dead load of 1.2 kips per foot, a new self weight now of 90 pounds per foot or 0 0.09 kips per foot. So everything's going to increase a little bit. PL is 40 kips, L is 35 feet. Notice how we are not going to need to update any of the live load analyses, right? The live load analyses are fine. There's nothing wrong with those. It's only the dead loads that we need to update. Okay? So here's what ends up happening. Your V dead ends up being 22.575 kips. Your M dead ends up being 197.53 foot kips. And I, and I would, I would uh, hope that you all can go back to step one and basically redo step one with instead of 1.25, 1.29. So that's what it ends up being. Uh, and then when you chug out your VU, VU is 59.09 kips and MU is 797.0 foot kips. So yeah, just a little bit bigger, not a lot, but just a little bit. Depending upon your problem and depending upon the consideration, dead load can have a little bit more of an impact than others. Like I can tell you in Bridgeland, you can find a much bigger impact on, dead, on, on self weight in bridges. Um, so it, again, I think this is a, a pretty valuable assessment. Okay, so here's MU, here's VU. Now we found that for a W30 by 90, we found that PMN was PMP, which is 1060. So what does that mean? That's our capacity. That's our factored load. We're good. All right. What is um, phi VN for the W30 by 90? 374. Are we good there? Oh, yeah. We're very good there. And if you want, what you can do is you can actually compute the live load maximum deflection. And when you do that, you get 0 0.59. And when you compare that to the limit of 0 0.7, that's OK. Yes, because the def if your deflection limit is based off live loads, not dead loads, because the deflection, so if we're looking at a live load deflection limit, it's not a function of the self-weight. So it'll always work as long as you pick one that's bigger. So this is where we can say use a W30 by 90. Boom. That's it. So if we had assumed a heavier self-weight, we wouldn't have had to update all of this. But I, I guess my hope is that you find that this is pretty straightforward. Like, there's a little bit of back and forth, but it's not difficult, is it? All right, does anybody have any questions on this? All right, yes. Why don't we have to for the dead load when we're doing it with a So that's a great question. So if you remember last time we talked about how we can usually in practice get around dead load deflections by cambering the beam. We can't get around them the same way with live loads. So that's why most of the deflection limits that we as engineers employ for design 
we're designing for live load deflection limits. That doesn't mean we don't need to camber the beam, right? Under dead load, this beam might deflect, I don't know, an inch and a quarter. I'm just making that up. So we would tell the fabricator, camber it an inch and a quarter. But we're still using this beam. Yeah. That's, I mean, so are we having to account for it? Yes, just not in design. Yeah. Sound good? All right, I'm going to blow your mind next time with some LTB. That's all I got. I will see you all on Wednesday. And just remember the eraser method and how it's not the right way to go.